Good morning and happy Sunday. Welcome to our Sunday teaching if you're watching this on Sunday. If you're not, then happy whatever day it is, I suppose. <laughs> uh, today we're going to continue our look in 1 Thessalonians. However, before we do that, kind of as a introductory topic that's very foundational, but for some people you're probably at a foundational level and, and that's fine. Um, talking about the Bible and and what we can find within it. So the Bible is a collection uh, of 66 books spread over a grand amount of time with many different authors, all divinely inspired. But um, And we have, you know, there's, there's basic Bibles, there's study Bibles, which will have commentaries built into them and articles and stuff like that. One of the interesting things about the different books of the Bible is that some of them were written during the same time period. And so it's, it's neat for context sake because we can look at, you know, first and second Kings and we can look at, you know, the life of David and what was happening with him. And then we can go and read the Psalms and, and hear his Psalms and associate that with the story of what he was going through. You can read the book of Judges and at the same time, you can go and look into the book of Ruth, which was written and well recorded at any rate, uh, about the time of Judges and where people would do what was right in their own eyes. And you can see how that affected people in a very uh, individual way. So that's neat. Um, and then what we're looking at today, one of the letters of the New Testament, which is called the Epistles, um, and the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is the actions of the early church. And so it's interesting to see that as we read a letter that Paul is writing to a specific church in a city, we can actually go back in Acts and see when it was that he went there. And then that can help us to understand a little bit about why he's writing what he's writing. And so to start today, Although we're looking at 1 Thessalonians, I want us to start by looking at Acts 17, which records when Paul went uh, to Thessalonica. And so, now when they had passed through, I'm going to butcher these names, but when they had passed through Amphipolis, Am, Amphipolis I don't know, and Apollonia, uh, they came to Thessalonica. Uh, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas and a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women, uh, but the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out, of, out to the crowd where they could not find them. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as a security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. They let them go. So now, that's the context of what happens when Paul goes to Thessalonica. He goes there, he preaches the gospel, he reasons with them in the synagogue. This was his custom. And some of the Jews follow, but a great amount of Greeks, and these, these are people that we call God-fearers. So they're not Jewish, but they recognize the legitimacy of the Jewish God, the God of the Bible, um, Yahweh. And then they, they, so they, they go to temple and they follow and, and they do want to know God and be known by God. And so when they hear this message, they respond to it. Yes, what you're saying is true. Um, and then this great persecution happens. This, this mob comes. They grab the guy who is hosting um, Paul and Silas and they drag him out to the courts. Um, and I 
assume from the text he was a man who had some monetary um, wealth and so he pays a fine instead of paying a penalty in some other way uh, that would be more physical probably and so right from the start it's like they they're there three weeks they commit their the lives to God there's a church that is born there and right then in that moment persecution happens um, and not at a small level but quite a grand level they grab him they you know they're trying to find Paul and Silas there's this huge mob fear and whatnot now with all of that as a full understanding of context let's look at our text today first Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 4 to 10 for we know brothers loved by God that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Um, for not only has the word of the Lord s- sounded uh, forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you have turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven. Uh, whom he has raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So that's our text for today. Thessalonica, busy trade city, an important city, a predominantly Gentile uh, city, but there obviously was a Jewish community there. Um, And the church itself, as I said, was made largely out of Gentiles, these God-fearers. And so And so uh, they recognize the legitimacy of God. And here we get a a bit of insight into how they initially responded when Paul shared the gospel with them. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Paul says that God has chosen them, that the gospel came um, not just in word, but in full conviction. And see, this is really important because knowing the life of Jesus, knowing the works of Jesus, being aware of what the Bible says and being aware of what the gospel is, it can just be head knowledge. It can just be intellectual knowledge that you have, that you, yes, Jesus is God and, and that you can know that without having a love and a loyalty for God. And that's a dangerous thing. Um, There's a difference between knowing something is intellectually true and having full conviction. That full conviction is having the knowledge, but that it has a deep effect on you and within you. A change of mind, yes. And a change of heart, yes. Head knowledge is not enough. There's another scripture verse in the Bible that talks about how even the demons know that Jesus is the Lord. It does not save them. Knowledge is not enough. Um, And so there's how it's revealed. Some will respond with acceptance and repentance and change. And others will respond with no change, no repentance, and no acceptance. And these two drastically different responses are in response to the exact same gospel. I mean, you see that right here in the story. Uh, Paul goes and he reasons with them. For three Sabbaths, he defends the faith and makes arguments from Scripture. Some choose to follow and some choose to try and, you know, drag the guy out of the town and stone him or something. And, uh, and that's how it goes. That's how it goes. As Christians, we can't control how people respond to the gospel. All we can do is present it and present it well. And so I have found that often people who have a uh, position against the gospel, position against Christianity, they'll come to you and, and as you're defending the faith, as you're presenting the gospel, as you're having those conversations, 
and they'll make arguments against you and they'll make questions against you and, and what you're presenting. And I have found quite often that when we show the answer or when we show a flaw in their argument, um, that really shows, you no, know, that's, that's not what the Bible says or that doesn't logically, you know, get rid of God. In fact, in, oftentimes the arguments call <laughs> for, for more reason for there to be a God. Um, it doesn't result in a changed mind or a changed heart. It's just like, okay, well, on, let's try and come up with something else. Or even if you can answer. And I've had that, had that conversation where I'll say to the person, you know, even if I answer all of your questions, are you, are you going to change your mind on this? No. Like, right. Your heart is hard. It's not just intellectual issues that you have. You have a heart issue with God. Um, and there's the truth of the matter is there are those who will never turn to God. Never. They love sin too much. They see God as evil. They see the idea of God as evil. Um, and they're, they're far from him. Present the gospel anyways, but understand that that is all we can do. Be faithful to God. Present it. It's up to them to respond how they will respond. Thankfully, the Thessalonians were not that way. They respond to the gospel. But it's not just how people receive the gospel. It's also how we, as Christians, present the gospel. And let me tell you, you don't need to be a preacher. You don't need to be a pastor or extroverted or anything like that to share the gospel. You can be afraid of talking to others about this. You can stutter and shake and and you can think to yourself, I can't do this. And that's fine, but God can. And God works in and through you in time and time again in the Bible and in the testimony that I have heard from others and in my own living. It is God in these it, it is God who is faithful and speaks through us in times when we don't have the words to say. He gives us the words to say. Um, and it's in those moments when we're leaning not on our own strength and not on our own understanding, but leaning on God, um, that he, he moves in a, in a very um, convicting way, very convicting way. The unplanned moments in conversations and in sermons um, this happens a lot where I'll be, I'll be preaching and someone will come up and they'll say, Hey, you, you spoke exactly into this situation that I'm going through. And they'll tell me what it was that I said. I'm like, that wasn't even on my sheet. I, I, I have notes that wasn't even in my notes that just came to me in the moment. And it's like, that happens in, in one-on-one conversations as well, where God will give us the things to say. But as Paul puts it, not just in words, but in power, Right. When we go, and as Christians, when we go and we have interactions with people, understand this. The Holy Spirit resides within you. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is with you. And so when you go, you, you bring the Holy Spirit with you. And one of the marvelous gifts of the Holy Spirit is conviction. Yes, on our own heart, but hopefully also as we present the gospel to others, that they would feel conviction. Um, and that one's living should back up how they talk. That when we present the gospel, when we talk about righteousness, we talk about the goodness of God, that the life that we live should also be an example of that. There's this little saying out there that people through time have used of, you know, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. It's a garbage saying. It's horrible. You look at the apostles, you look at church history, people always preached. People always used their words. It's not enough just to be nice and loving and kind. That's good. But that's not enough. We have to verbally present the gospel. But the sentiment of what they're trying to get at with that statement is is this, that our living should back up what it is that we're saying. Preach the gospel and in your life, in how you live, let that also be an example to others of of Christ and his work in you. Christianity is not a do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do religion. Um, we are called to be imitators of Christ and to be Im- and, and to our leaders, right? Follow me as I follow Christ. That's an important thing. The text continues. It says, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sakes. Paul brings up the conduct and character that he and Silas had while they visited the city. He brings this up more in depth later in the letter. But here he, he hints at it. 
But this is where the old saying of, of actions speak louder than words comes into play. And that one does, that is true. If you say, you know, hey, no one touched these cookies. And then you're there stuffing your face with cookies and handing them out. It's like, do you want us to eat them or not? Like, what are you doing here? Our actions need to be in line with our words. Otherwise, we are a hurt to the gospel and we are bad representatives. Paul has himself in check. He is watching his conduct. He is making sure that he is being a good and proper representative of Christ because he knows that if he acts poorly, well, first of all, it's dishonoring towards God and it's sinful, but also it's detrimental to how he presents the gospel. We talked about this last week, false representatives. And, and that's why he says, for your sake, that his, his conduct is to their benefit because then they receive the gospel in power and in truth. And those who call themselves Christians while looking nothing like Christ are a harm to those around them. Because what happens is, is they'll look at that person. And I have a little list here we'll go through in a moment. But they look at this person who claims to be in line with Christ, but is not. Is living against the ways of Christ. And they associate Christianity with that person. And they say, well, I want nothing to do with that. It's a bad representative. He doesn't represent us. He doesn't represent the scriptures. He certainly doesn't represent Christ. And so it's important not to be silent about these misrepresentations so that people understand what is a Christian and what is not a Christian. So Mormonism is not Christianity. Jehovah Witnesses are not Christianity. The progressive church or the progressive Christian movement um, is drastically far from, from Christianity. It is woke nonsense. It's utter trash. Um, the United Church is, is falling away, is abandoning true Christianity to please the world. So I would say not Christianity. Um, cultural Christians where they just want the benefits of Christianity um, without the relationship to God. And, and that one's we we'll take a little bit more to define today, but, but that's not. The prosperity gospel is not Christianity. Spiritual manipulation where people use um, psychology and, and, and whatnot to manipulate people into thinking they're having a spiritual encounter when they're really not. Um, and we talked about that before, but like we, we can play certain tunes on the piano and dim the lights just right and, and kind of how we speak and how we build as we preach. We can... We can manipulate people actually quite easily. Um, and so, well, we don't, but there's a lot out there that do. That's not genuine Christianity. That's not what Paul was doing here. He goes, he reasons with them. Um, the Bible talks about how there will be many deceivers. And there, there is. That's only a few. There is a lot more. You can look at the Mother God cult and you can look at you know all these other cults that come up. Um, and all these other groups that, you know, even maybe started Christianity, but then they adopted weird theologies and they focused on that and they left, left the truth for the deceived. Uh, wolf and sheep's clothing coming to the flock, in and around it, scaring off those who would come to the flock's gates. And um, it's important as the shepherd to give those wolves um, a good beating, send them off, and, uh, and not allow them to hinder the sheep that are in the flock. And hinder those who would come and join it as well. So, be a good representative of Christ. Adopt the culture of heaven. Don't compromise. Stand for truth. Be kind, gracious, humble, peaceful. Be biblical. Uh, the text continues, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. Uh, you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Um, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. Bigger chunk of text. Maybe I should have cut that one in half, but the start there echoes what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. Follow me as I follow Christ. Be imitators of me as we are imitating Christ. Notice the condition that they receive the word in, in much affliction. Counting the cost. Uh, for many of us, our conversion to Christianity didn't seem to have any immediate negative repercussions. And negative, maybe not is the word, but 
um, harmful, painful. It didn't it didn't seem to cost much at first. That's we like that because it's comfortable. It's not good. Um, the truth is is regardless of of your situation of how you came to Christ, saying yes to Christ means saying no to others. It's not always the case that people come to Christ and it costs them nothing. There are those who who come uh, and like this group, they believe in what Paul is saying. They believe in the gospel that is presented to them. They turn to follow Christ and everything goes chaotic that the world gets turned upside down and the very people whom once loved them and trusted them now are out to get them. Uh, in Matthew 10, 21 to 22, brother will deliver brother over to death and the father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated for all by my name, for my name's sake, uh, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And then still in Matthew 10, but 34 to 39, do not think that I have come to bring peace to earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy uh, of me. And whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my name's sake will find it. Now, it's not saying you have to despise your family, but it is saying that Jesus comes first. And that for many people, and probably if we look at history, and we look at it at a global level, for the majority of people, coming to Christ means that some of the most dearest relationships you have are going to turn from peace to turmoil. Um, let me just say, as I've said many times to many people over the years, it is worth it. It is so, so worth it. Um, the peace that we have in Christ is so much greater than the chaos we have in the world as we follow him. Those who come to Christ and it seems that it hasn't cost you very much, that isn't a good thing. Comfortable Christianity um, where the level of persecution that you face is at Christmas time, someone says happy holidays to you instead of Merry Christmas, it makes for weak Christianity it makes you so comfortable that when the slightest genuine persecution happens, many people will run. It's in the struggle that we find on how much we hold on to Christ. Notice when we look at here in, in this section of text, but when we look at history uh, around the globe once again, it is where the church is persecuted that it grows. Um, and there's something about that. That the Christian who has faced great troubles but has kept the faith, um, that's the faith that moves mountains. That's the Christian who, who can say, regardless of anything that happens, I'm with you, God. I'm following you because I've faced the darkness and I know that you are good and I know that you are with me. In 1 Peter 4, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. But let no one suffer as a murderer or a thief, as an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet anyone who suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So, so don't don't face persecution because you're doing something immoral. That's the repercussions of your sinful living. But those who face persecution because you stand for the ways of God, rejoice in that. Rejoice in that persecution and understand that it means you're doing the right thing. Um, and that God is with us and that we will, sh as we share in his sufferings, so will we share in the glory, in the kingdom of God. In Romans 5, it says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Wonderful text. Recognize that the suffering, the persecution that you face makes you stronger as a Christian. 
um, and hold on to Christ in the midst of that. Do not back away from it. And so what will it cost you? Coming to Christ, your commitment to God, what will it cost you? Maybe it will cost you a relationship with those that you love. Maybe it will cost you the respect of your peers. Maybe it will cost you promotions and jobs because you hold a moral, co- uh, moral code that makes it difficult for you to do the tasks that they would want you to do. Maybe the teachers of your children will target your children. Maybe the other kids won't want to play with them. Maybe you'll be beat or imprisoned. And I know that this sounds like a drastic statement uh, to make in Canada, Um, but I can look at the laws that have been tried and have been passed in the last number of years, and I can look at the direction of the culture, and and I I do believe that there's a strong possibility um, that there will be a day where me and my peers, fellow preachers who hold to the word, could find ourselves locked up for holding the views that we hold. If that day comes, brothers, be faithful. Continue to present the word. Uh, Don't don't allow the fear of persecution to stand in the way, but understand God is control. Some think that's a, a drastic statement. It's a reality in much of the world, and it very easily could become one here as well. And so we can say maybe this or maybe that, But understand the cost should not be underestimated. Whoever loses his life for my name's sake finds it, like (laughs) gets it all. Um, It's worth the cost. But in Luke 14, Jesus gives this teaching. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and his own mother and his own wife and his children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We'll pause there. Um, it's the idea of value, that you love God way more, that the love that you have for God makes the love you have for other things look like hate in a way. Don't be hateful towards people. Um, We can talk about that another day perhaps, but we should love God the most. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, so dying to self, putting the life that you held and found dear, putting that aside, following Christ, abandoning everything else, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has had enough to complete it, otherwise he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish. And all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what kind of king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down and first deliberate, whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while their other is yet a great way off, he sends his delegation to ask for terms of peace. So therefore, anyone who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. It's this idea of you need to count the cost. And this is a frustration I have where people will present the gospel and they'll present down this watered down thing of come to Jesus. It will cost you nothing. It could cost you everything. Lay down your life. It could literally cost you your life someday. But come to him. It is worth it. And what happens is is people do not count the cost. They come to God. And as soon as the going gets tough, as soon as they realize, oh, the sin that I want to do, God doesn't want me to do, they abandon their faith because their faith is weak, because it was built on lies and watered down truth. Um, And so when we present the gospel, give people the full picture. Let them understand this is not something to take lightly. This is not something to add to your living. This is something that overrides your current living. It completely changes everything. Um, and so you, if you're coming to Christ, you need to be willing to put him above absolutely everything. If you're not willing to do that, there's no point in you coming to Christ. Um, because your faith will fail and it's not genuine and you are not only misleading yourself, but you're potentially misleading others. The Bible has this other teaching that Jesus does where he says, the kingdom of God is like a man who is walking through a field and he trips on something and he looks back at what he tripped on and he discovers a great treasure. And so with much haste, He goes back and sells everything that he has that he might buy the field and obtain the treasure. And so the question is, as you look at Christ, 
as you look at Christianity, as you look at what he has done and what it costs to know him, are you willing to go back into town, sell everything you have, give everything up? And that does, doesn't just mean the physical things that you have. Are you willing to give up everything in order to have Christ? If not, you've miscounted the cost. Uh, or you're just being true to yourself and you're not interested in that. You're more interested in your sinful living um, and building your in- own kingdom. But understand that you will live life with pleasures for now, um, but that leads to eternal damnation, that leads to separation from, from God, and ultimately it is horrible for you um, and not proper. The, the key here, the cost is great. It's worth every cent. It's worth all that it is. If it costs you absolutely everything, if you resemble Job and then you die for it, it is still worth it. Um, So despite the great uh, affliction that they saw, they recognized that it was worth it. And in the affliction that the Thessalonians went through, they had joy from the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit gave them a joy. The Bible talks about how we have a joy that goes beyond understanding. The peace of God, Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is different than happiness. Happiness is fluff. It's temporal. It, it, it's fading. Joy and peace is, especially when we look at it in the Christian context, it's despite the circumstances, I can have hope in Christ. I can have peace in Christ. I can have joy in Christ. And so, The joy that one can have in the midst of affliction is a marvelous testimony and becomes an encouragement to others around you. And even here, it says, you know, the whole region, they told Paul about what a great testimony this church was. It's like when we hear the stories of those who have faced great persecution and yet they've stayed strong in their faith. It's just like, that's right. It's worth the cost. Lord be with me. Help me to face the day. And faithful in suffering at times can be, probably more often, a greater testimony than a miraculous healing or a miraculous deliverance from a situation. It's in the faithfulness. The faithfulness. And so while you face persecution, the answer isn't always, Lord, deliver me from this. But it's, Lord, may you be glorified and may I be faithful in this. The text continues, And how you turned from God towards idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Coming to God, as I've said, is not adding him, like putting him on the shelf with some other gods. It is dying to self. It is turning away from these things. They turn from idols. And as we talked before, many other religions, many other places in the world, they have multiple idols they're either nothing or they're demons. And regardless, they're trash. Um, and, and people should turn from those, turn from those and adopt Christ, follow his ways, love him and be loyal to him. And as Christians, we are not to tolerate these other views. And that doesn't mean we're to be militant or anything like that. But don't be like, oh yeah, you can believe what you want and, and that's good for you. Your truth is yours and mine is mine. It's a logical nonsense. There is but one truth. It is Christ. And so stand for that. And in, it is in this faith that we are delivered from the wrath to come. And so we might look at the persecution that we go through. And you know, might find yourself in the world somewhere else in another culture where there's a grand level of persecution. You might come to Christ and lose all the things that you will hold dear but the, the wrath of that persecution is nothing compared to what those who are outside of Christ will face on the day of judgment. So hold on to Christ. In the midst of our persecution, understand this. He sustains us. He is glorified as we are faithful. And the joy and peace and, and, and that is to come 
You know, the Bible talks about this day where we will enter into the kingdom of God and there will be no more weeping. There will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. He wipes that away. That right there is worth going through a life here that is full of difficulty to have eternity there with him. So stay faithful, run the course, um, finish the race, hold on to the truth. Uh, Don't give in to the ways of the world. Don't allow persecution and difficulty to make you abandon your faith, but instead turn that completely around and say, I'm going to grow from this. I'm going to be more faithful. I'm going to be stronger in my faith. And God, may you be glorified in the difficulty that I face. That is our look at 1 Thessalonians verses 4 to 10. Uh, I hope you are encouraged. I hope your faith grows as you go through difficulty and that you'll see that God is allowing you to go through the struggle um, for a reason, that he would be glorified in it and that you would be stronger because of it. Lord, I love you. I love your word. Pray for my brothers and sisters on the other side of the screen. You would be with us. Help us to know you more. Help us to represent you well, that we would preach the gospel, that we'd be ready in and out of season to give a reason for why we believe what we believe. I love you, Lord. Amen. Have a great week. Honor God in all that you do.